Further, the Leonard McDonald AJP said at 5.30 to 5.31, it is important to bear in mind that a ruling on admissibility is not final. Relevant evidence led in the main trial may be taken into account by the judge or magistrate when reviewing his decision on admissibility, no matter what the source of such relevant than evidence might be. There is no reason why this should not also be the position when a trial within a trial is held. The Lieutenant Shoes, Judge Shoes, in the case of S versus Muchinindu, 2002 SACR 313 Whitewater's Rent. A ruling on admissibility on a trial within a trial is interlocutory and may be reviewed at the end of the trial in the light of later evidence. The principle in itself shows that subsequent evidence in the main trial may decisively affect the determination of the issues in the trial within a trial. And if subsequent evidence may, why not? also earlier evidence. Right, with that caveat, let me add the case of S versus Nduli, 1993 to SACR 599, which waters rent. It's a judgment on appeal, which was before Zulman and Nugent, who in my view are some of the most brilliant judges this country has produced. Now, having the caveat of what Sotetsi says, I'm going to read in full what these judges say. Accordingly, the only reason advanced in the judgment for admitting the confession was that the evidence given by the appellant was unsatisfactory. The evidence which he relied upon, that is the magistrate, for reaching this conclusion is all, was all given after the confession was admitted and related, and it related to the contents of the confession rather than the alleged coercion. The evidence relating to the coercion had been given during the trial within a trial and was not scrutinized at all. It is difficult to see in those circumstances on what grounds the magistrate admitted the confession in the first place. The magistrate appears to have been under the impression that a confession may be admitted during a trial, provided only that at the end of the trial, the evidence as a whole is sufficient to justify the admissibility. The admission of a confession on the basis that evidence may later emerge to justify the, its admission would, in my view, constitute a gross irregularity and reduce the procedure for determining whether a confession is admissible to nothing more than a charade. The admissibility or otherwise of a confession falls to be determined on the evidence placed before a court in a trial within a trial together with the admissible evidence which has gone before it. If at the end of the trial within the trial the requisites of, for admissibility have not been proved, the confession may or must be excluded. It cannot be admitted on the basis that other evidence may emerge during the course of the trial to justify its admission. Once a confession is admitted, its admission is provisional only in the sense that evidence may thereafter emerge which requires it to be excluded. Then it goes the case of R. Malazani, 1952, 3 SA 639, at 644E. It's an AD case. The other case is S versus W, 1963, 3 SA 516, appellate division. And the other case is S versus Lamini, and another, 1971, 1 SA 807. Right, that is the law. So it mustn't be argued that this judge 
didn't consider the evidence regarding coercion. In other words, the synopsis of the encapsulation of the evidence, the salient features are this, that when the state intended to bring into play by introducing the so-called alleged confessions or statements of accused number one and two and the pointing out by accused number two, the defense objected. And the principal objection was that one, they did not make statements. They did not make confessions. They were told to sign documents which were fully completed and they were told sign here, sign there, initial here, initial there. That was the initial defense. The second defense is that they were assaulted, tortured, severely, as Mr. Gomez would put it, severely tortured, tubed, electrocuted, kicked, in order to elicit their signatures on the documents. In other words, these accused before court, their evidence is they don't know the contents of the, of the confession. They don't know. They were never read to them. And if you go further, accused number one, for instance, says when he went to sign the <coughs> confession or statements before Maboto, I think. Maboto never even sat down. When Maboto came, they were assaulting him. All that group of policemen. And Maboto then called him aside and said, hey, you know what? Why don't you sign this document? These guys are going to injure you. And then, to save his life, accused number one says he signed. No discussion with Maboto in an office sitting down, according to accused number one. Accused number two also says, uh, when he went to sign the alleged confession or statement before Mrs. Kronje, all he said when he got in, even before Mrs. Kronje could introduce himself, as herself as a magistrate, he came in and told Mrs. Matraping, the interpreter, that may you tell the lady please that uh, six weeks I haven't had a bath from the 16th of June, I think. And also that I want to speak to my daughter, I want to speak to my partner or parents. And that was it. And he sat down and looked at the ground. And Mrs. Kronje, what he did was, he was busy with his computer. She never asked him anything. All she was interested in was the computer, and then she would get out and gossip with a fellow magistrate or fellow white lady and come back. Mohoru was going in and out, in and out, consulting with Mrs. Kronje. Nothing was discussed between accused number one, um, number two, and Mrs. Kronje, except, as I said, that I haven't had a bath and I want to speak to my daughter and my partner. Nothing. The same applies for Rapudu. <coughs> accused number two says, no discussion with Rapudu, nothing. It was just written up and told to sign. So in the main, that is the salient aspects of the evidence relating to the trial within a trial. It's obvious that uh, Geninda, Maholewa, and others gave evidence. But what I want us to understand is that this court, after careful analysis, of the evidence adduced by the state, and after careful analysis of the cross-examination interposed by the defense against the evidence adduced by the state, and after careful analysis of the rebuttal evidence of accused number one and two, and the cross-examination interposed by the state, and after careful analysis of the heads of argument, by all the parties concerned, and the verbal submissions made by 
all the councils in this court. I have dealt, not like this magistrate did, I've dealt with all the evidence relating to whether the said alleged confessions were made freely and voluntarily in the sound and sober senses of the deponents without any force or coercion. I've dealt with all that and I've also dealt with uh, the other primary defense by the accused, that all the accused were not apprised of their constitutional rights, meaning section 35.5 of their rights. They were not, not, never apprised according to that. And this court even also interrogated that. And as we all know, Section 35 encapsulates the concept that if any evidence is acquired through the infringement of the Bill of Rights, that evidence should not be admitted into the record of the proceedings relating to Section 17 and Section 18 even Section 19 of the Criminal Procedure Act rights. Consequently, after going through all that evidence carefully, this court has reached the following conclusion. One, it rules that the confessions made, the confession made by accused number one was made freely and voluntarily without any coercion, when accused number one was in his firm, sound, and sober senses. Two, the confession made by accused number two in respect of the said confession being taken by Mrs. Ronger, the magistrate, the court rules that it was made freely and voluntarily without any coercion, when accused number two was in his full and sober senses. And also the confession made before Colonel Rapudi was also made by accused number one, two. Freely and voluntarily without any coercion when he was in his sound and sober senses. And also the pointing out made by accused number two before Colonel Khadebe were also made freely and voluntarily without any coercion when accused number two was in his full and sober senses. Okay, that is the ruling. Yes, Mr. My Lord, may we perhaps adjourn for a short while just to have a plenary meeting with my colleagues as to the conduct of uh, the proceedings going forward. We, okay, fine. We discussed that briefly just before we resume this morning. So how long do we adjourn? Um, I think about 15 minutes should do. Okay, 15 minutes.